So my husband just had, I'm getting set up here. My husband just had his 39th birthday. And for his birthday, I offered him what I thought was the most loving, profound, and shatteringly powerful message I could. So on his 39th birthday, the beginning of his 40th year, I said, my beloved, you are, statistically speaking, about half done. Now, the reason I shared this with him is on when I turned 40, I had this realization that statistically speaking, I am in fact about half done. And I shared, I was, I don't know why, but I was pretty lit up by this. Uh, not necessarily in, a, in an all good way, but it, it, I felt the ener I felt activated. I felt energized by this somehow. So I told all of my friends and they too felt very energized by it, but not in the way, not in the good way. So a lot of them told me to stop saying it. Some of them told me that it made them anxious. You know, people would say, you know, stop saying that. That's so terrible. So I, I want to ask you, I don't know where you are in the, the temporal, the chronology of your life, but this idea of being half done with your life, what kind of emotions, what are the energetic, the emotional energetics of that question? Do you feel hopeful and possible and energized and focused? Or do you feel, does that make you feel anxious? Do you feel a sense of dread? Does it make you feel overwhelmed or down? Whatever the feeling is, and particularly if it is a feeling in this box of negative emotional energetics, I would encourage you to stay with it. Just be curious about it and just stay with it. The reason is everything that you want in your life that you have been trying to achieve but you can't because you feel stuck, the solution to the stuckness is in the box that we have been avoiding over and over and over again. And what I can tell you is because I am so sure of this, this is the reason I have dedicated my life to pain, to helping people process their pain, not because I'm, I'm a big two thumbs up, 10 out of 10, highly recommend pain. No, it is because pain and power are always two sides of the same coin. The second thing is that when we actually hold our pain, it is never, ever, 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 as traumatizing, terrifying, demonic as the monsters in our mind would convince us that it would be. So there's this horrible paradox in life where your brain on one hand says, mm, that, that memory, that situation, that, that risk that you want to take, don't do it, don't do it, it will crush you. And the, the paradox, which can either be incredibly inspiring or I think incredibly depressing is if you go forward to the places you have not yet gone, there you will find tremendous relief and more than just relief, you will find a peaceful power. So this thing about being half done, if it does engender a sense of dread or anxiety or a feeling of lowness, it can be helpful to realize that that's not always the case. So there's other things that we care a great deal about that we are delighted, relieved, hopeful, happy when they're half done. So for example, imagine that my house is a mess and I have to go through the slog of cleaning it up. Well, when I am halfway through, I don't feel bad. I mean, maybe I feel bad that I still have halfway to go, but I, the fact that half of it is gone makes me feel relieved, thankful, possible. If I am someone who likes to run marathons, I in fact am not, but imagine that someone is, mile number 13 has to be a pretty lucky mile number, right? So if you make this massive commitment, you put your body through this tremendous form of exertion and you've already made it halfway, I would imagine being halfway done doesn't make you feel dread or panic or down. You feel possible, hopeful, thankful, relieved, our children, or I'm happy to speak 
about myself specifically. When our kids are incredibly little, when they are uh, neurobiologically incredibly dependent, that can be very overwhelming. I am not someone who will paint parenting with a single brush. I think I, parenting, it reminds me of the phrase, the phrase I like to use to describe parenting is the radiant agony. So their needs can sometimes be oppressive. So when you realize that they are getting more and more independent, they're, you know, halfway to independence, whatever that means in your mind, it's not terrible. In fact, it can be very exciting, very relieving, very life-giving. All of these things, our homes, our bodies, when we do some kind of great physical feat, and, and certainly our children, we adore these things. We cherish them. They are the heartbeat of our lives. And so when we're halfway done with some of these tasks, we don't feel dread and panic and we feel the opposite. We feel alive and hopeful and possible and relieved. So the question then becomes, if you are thinking about the trajectory of your life, the energy of your life, the power of your life, and the idea of being halfway done feels oppressive, I want to suggest some things to you that I hope will reconnect you with your power and be soothing. So I like this, this term peaceful power. I want to talk to you about the energetics of that. So the brain is the most exquisite electrochemical machine in the entire universe. And to achieve a life beyond your wildest dreams, beyond what you thought was possible, it's important to get the energy right. It is important to tune in to the energetics of what it means to live a radically powerful life. Now listen closely to me, because I think this is the place where the tremendous shift happens. You do not have to hustle. You do not have to dig deeper. You do not have to want it more. You do not have to lean in harder. You don't need to put in more elbow grease. You do not have to walk a thousand more miles on your knees to prove that you are worthy. A lot of us have done that and we are exhausted. So what I want you to understand is that really the only thing you need to do is return to your mother tongue. Return to the energetics of your emotional mother tongue. Your mother tongue, your native language, is the first language you spoke from the second you were born, right? The yelling and the screaming and the gnashing and the thrashing, there's power there. There's an essential communication there. It is not all bad. It is not something that just needs to be avoided. I do think a lot about the finiteness of this life. And the reason I think about the finiteness of this life is because it connects me with my power. The myth is that this will go on and on and on and on. And so when I think it goes on and on and on and on, I don't have to take each day as sacred. At the end of my life, when I stand before God, the Alpha and the Omega, I want to be able to say to God, I have used it all. I haven't just used the good times and the easy times and the times that I wanted to and the times it all flowed. I have used the pain and the anxiety and the unworthiness and the suffocation. I have used it all. And more importantly, I have used this wisdom that I believe I have to serve other people, to help them take their pain and to use that pain not as something that forevermore must be avoided, but to convert it into the very source of their healing and their power. The universe is filled with all kinds of frequencies. Last night, huge storms, tornadoes touching down. Welcome to the Midwest in the summer. Okay, nature is highs and lows. It is good and bad. It is flow and it is choppy. So we ha if we believe that we are a part of nature, not separate from it, but truly a part of it, then we have to ask, what does all that energy mean inside of our own body? And so I want to talk to you now about something that I call part two, the great journey home. 
So the reason it's part two would mean that there is a part one. And I think that the universe communicates to us through the math of twos a lot, right? We have light and dark. We have day and night. We have good and bad. We have up and down. We have big and small. And perhaps the most important human one and two is the distinction between myself and other. The self and the other. The husband and the wife, the mother and the child, the human and the God. Okay? So when you were six months old, you had what is arguably the most profound realization of your life, that you were not a part of your mother, that your mother was a separate entity and that you were a separate entity. And from there forth, you would only understand the world through yourself and other, right? This is why we, it's so easy for us to other. So in part one, part one is essential. And because it's essential, it's natural. And because it's natural, it's wonderful. Part one is what I think people would classically call the formation of the ego. So it's in part one that I learn, I am a good girl. I am a good boy. I am a, an athlete. I am smart. I am successful. People like me. People don't like me. I am a fixer. I am a victim. Okay? All of this is, is fine and, and frankly necessary. The problem happens here. The first part of life is to form the container of the self, right? To say there's this edge. Now, having a boundary is absolutely necessary. In order to be a full, whole human being in life, you need a center and an edge, okay? If you don't have an edge, you're just everywhere, okay? There's no core self. So when you have this edge, the problem though that happens then is your brain, its number one function is to be a pattern detector. I talked about this in an earlier video. And so if there's ever a, the, the, the times when you get the most activated is when there is a threat to our primary identity pattern. So God forbid, I think that I'm really smart. And then I say something, oh my God, I think I said something and it was stupid. Oh my God, they heard me say something stupid. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Let's say I'm the person who is the know-it-all. And I don't happen to have an answer. Oh my God, how am I supposed to live like that? How am I supposed to live like that? Let's say I'm like the, the perfect parent. And then people watch my kids lose their shit at the neighborhood block party. So embarrassing. So embarrassing. How am I supposed to live now that people don't think that I'm the perfect parent? Okay. If I think that I'm like the, the pretty one. And now I'm aging. Now I have wrinkles and gray hair. It's very anxiety provoking to my core identity in, the, in this sense, right? Or if I think I'm like strong and athletic and now I have a dad bod, what am I supposed to do with this? Does that make sense? This is essential and necessary, but it is power with a little P. And I don't mean that in a pejorative sense. I just mean it is not the greatest source of your power. Right? If you think about the universe, it's infinitely large. Your, your small identity, whether you're the fixer or the martyr or the helper or the hero, whatever that is, I like to call it the bumper sticker. It's just power with a, with a lowercase p. And part of the reason it's not a great sense of, source of power is we hemorrhage. We hemorrhage energy protecting that boundary. God forbid there's an incursion and someone thinks I'm not really the funny one. Someone thinks I'm not really the smart one. Someone thinks I don't really have all the answers. Someone thinks I'm not the special one. We go ape shit. That's a technical term for you. Protecting that perimeter of our identity. Okay? I think we can all agree that being in a defensive posture is certainly not the most powerful posture from which to live our lives. So part two. Part two happens when one day I wake up and I have done all the hustle and I have done the grind and I have gotten all the things and I have checked all the boxes and I have the house and I have the kids and I take care of people and I have money or I have, you know, success or I have whatever, whatever the things are for you. Check, 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 check. And you wake up one day and you say, oh my God. Is this all there is? That is the most blessed, gracious, exciting potential day of your life. Now, 
Whenever we come into a time of expansion, whenever we are in the energy of expansion, of birth, of creating, it does not always at that moment in time feel good, okay? So most of us aren't jumping on our beds, having a party the day we're like, oh my God, is this it? Is this it, right? We feel depressed, we feel panicked, we feel like I've been, I've been the good girl, I've been the good boy, I've been the, you know, I've leaned in, I've checked all the boxes and is this all there is? But now finally, the, the, that impermeable structure, that boundary of the earlier self starts to fall off. And when that starts to fall away, you finally have the opportunity to hold on to the parts of your primary part one identity that are valuable to you, but you finally have the chance to expand to your most powerful and universal self. And this is what I call the great journey home. So I'm gonna be talking about this idea of part two, the second half of life, the great journey home, the journey toward your truest and most powerful self. If this is interesting to you, please let me know. If there's things you liked or didn't like, please let me know. And if you think that this kind of a conversation would be energizing and powerful for certain people in your life, please feel free to share it. Thanks so much.